So welcome everybody to this wonderful presentation of a collaboration between the Center of Excellence for Behavior Management and the Center of Excellence for Autism. This came, it's been a huge request from so many different people. Um, I've been presenting much more in the last year or so. And I have to say, every single time I present, I get questions from participants about what about students with autism and do we address this differently than neurotypical students? And so I was really excited to have um, Andrew Bennett and Kim Segal join us to be presenting uh, on this. And so I'm Catherine Cora. I'm the coordinator of the Center of Excellence for Behavior Management, and I'll leave uh, my colleagues present themselves. So Andrew, maybe you can be the next oh, okay. one. Okay, sure. Uh, I'm Andrew Bennett. I am the co-coordinator of the Center of Excellence for ASD at Lester B. Pearson School Board. I'm a clinical psychologist and the other element of my role at Lester B is to coordinate um, the family school support and treatment team, which is a team that really is the focus on supporting kids with social emotional behavioral difficulties. So I have kind of the, the two aspects of our presentation today um, as part of my kind of day-to-day -day work. So I'm, I'm looking forward to speaking to you all. Thank you so much, Andrew. And Kim? Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Siegel. I'm an autism consultant for the Lester B. Pearson School Board, part of the Center of Excellence for ASD. Uh, I've been working at the school board uh, for 12 years. I've been an ASD consultant for three years now. I work privately in clinics. I see clients at home. I have my own practice as well. Um, and as my role as an ASD consultant, I oversee eight to nine schools per year and about, about 110 dossiers for ASD students. So I live and breathe the forefront and I'm on the school ground. So I live and breathe what it's like. And I can't wait to give you that portion of the presentation today. Very excited. Thank you so much, Kim. And uh, I, we had a good question in the chat. I just wanted to answer it now. Um, in terms of the PowerPoint, uh, we will be sharing after the presentation, we'll be sending an email to all of you. Will you will be receiving a certificate of attendance, we'll be receiving the PowerPoint, and we also have additional slides that will be bigger, um, that we thought would be easier to read, that we'll be sending to you as well. Um, and so that's uh, all of the resources you'll be seeing here right now, you will be getting access to those. And of course, the recording will be available on our website, um, probably not before tomorrow or the day after. Uh, we'll do our best to, uh, to take care of that. So I'll share screen so we can start this presentation. And so um, here are some of the main points that we'll be covering today, starting off um, with, with the section on behavior, um, kind of just as a starting point, making sense of what is behavior, what's at the root of behavior, how can behavior change, um, and then, of course, because the topic is uh, around students with autism, trying to see, um, <clears throat> looking at, at students with autism and their behavior, does it look different from, from neurotypical students? Um, things to consider, comor comorbidities, we're going to look at trauma, um, and of course, best practices. Uh, many of you are here ultimately for what to do when, and so we definitely will have a section on that um, towards uh, the second part of this presentation. So with no further ado, um, I think it is important to take the time to define behavior. Um, and one of the things that, that I really appreciate about these two or three different definitions that I have here is that it, it is um, the individual and any species, and so even animals and so forth, the, the behavior is a response to a particular situation or a stimulus in the internal or external environment. And so it's not something that the person necessarily chooses to do or does intentionally or on purpose. It really is a response to a situation. The second definition that adds on a bit more information that I really appreciate as well is that the responses, although maybe bothersome or, or disturbing in the classroom, you know, for, for many of us who are working with a lot of students with needs, it doesn't mean that the behavior is not adapted to the particular situation at hand that has triggered the response. And so understanding that there is a raison d'être, there's a purpose behind some of this behavior. Behavior is communication. Um, and oftentimes reveals an underlying need. It can be conscious to some extent, but it doesn't mean that because it's conscious that the person is doing it on purpose. Um, and, and for some, especially little ones or those who um, you know, have, have struggles to some extent in terms of functionality, it can be unconscious. Uh, and of course, there could be a portion where the, the 
environment can play a role. And of course, uh, in terms of genetics, that can play a role as well. Um, for those who will be putting questions right now in the chat, I invite you to put in the questions as you're going, but we will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and so even though students, it may seem like I said conscious, understanding that there's something beneath that is pushing the behavior, whether it's emotion for survival purposes or instincts to be able to protect ourselves and so forth. Um, and so when we're looking at all of these behaviors, really what we want to make sense of is not at the top of the iceberg and trying to address it directly because, you know, given the years and years of experience that I've had working with staff and students, I've come to the realization that sometimes trying to, to address it directly may have some impact to some degree in the moment, but really it doesn't have an impact necessarily in depth or on the long run. And so trying to make sense of what's happening underneath and to be able to address the at, at the root in terms of where the needs are really has a more in-depth type of impact. So in terms of what's at the root of the, um, the behavior, we will be looking at that. But before we get to that, pay, that place, I wanted to mention that we need to be careful to not view behavior in isolation. And so you could have three different students that can act out in attack that could be kicking somebody. And it could be for three different reasons that the child is kicking. Or you could have um, two different children that are having two different behaviors. And although it looks different from the outside, the root of it for these two different behaviors is actually quite similar. Um, and so the more that we're informed about how the brain works and how development works and how the relationship has an impact, the more it gives us information about the, the communication of that behavior. Um, and one of the things that I did want to mention, because there's a lot of literature out there about tantrums versus meltdowns, and this, ex this, this differentiation between the fact that a tantrum is something that is in the control of the child, that the child is conscious when they're doing this, they're intentionally doing this on purpose to gain some sort of uh, impact versus a meltdown where the child has some sort of um, sensory overload or some sort of, of you know, emotional reaction and that, that this is unconscious or out of their control. I really want to nuance here that, that no matter what type of behavior, most behaviors, if not all behaviors, have a reason behind it. And so, especially for those, those students that we work with at the elementary level, and even some at the high school level, and especially with children on the spectrum, um, it, it may seem at times that the child is in control of it, but I can promise you that there are so many things at play here underneath the iceberg. Um, you know, for example, different emotions that may be pushing them, different instincts that may be pushing them, um, having stressors, or even trauma, um, Andrew's going to be speaking to this a bit later, um, whether they're defended, whether it's because they're immature, because they're of their age, or because they've had a hard life, and, and that's played in the development of their maturation. Sensitivity is the big piece that we're going to be speaking of, which is that umbrella where ASD fits under. And of course, of course attachment pre plays a role as well. And I don't mean in the sense as to whether the, the student is attached to us adults or not. It's are they attuned to us in that moment? And all of that has an impact on the behavior. And even if in that moment, we may see it more as a tantrum than as a meltdown, it doesn't mean that there are not other elements at play that is pushing the child in their reactions. And so in terms of that umbrella of sensitivity, we're speaking to, to uh, autistic students uh, mostly, but please keep in mind that there's so many other key elements um, that, that are underneath that umbrella. Gifted kids fit, it, fit in underneath this umbrella. Um, you know, students with, with certain attention problems that have emotion dysregulation, censoring process, uh, processing issues and so forth. There are many different elements here that can contribute to this hypersensitivity and that has an impact on the behavior. And so rather than looking at it as just the child's autistic or the child's gifted or the child's neurotypical, what I invite you to shift your lens is more to look at the level of support that these students require. And so are we talking about a level one uh, where it's just a, you know, a, a typical a tier one type of you know, best practices for all requiring some of that level of support? Or are we talking about a student who requires more substantial types of support and level three where they require very substantial types of support? 
And so oftentimes the students that um, myself, Andrew and Kim work with tend to be more into the level two and level three, but it doesn't mean that students at level one don't need to have on a daily basis, certain measures and structures put in place to help them be more successful in their schooling environment. And so part of the piece that I wanted to speak to really briefly, because I do want to leave uh, you know, room for Andrew and Kim to speak, um, it's, it's just kind of bringing it back to the, to the brain and understanding where emotions come from and how this has an impact on behavior. Um, and so, of course, emotions are quite primitive. They're not in the, the thinking part of the brain. They're more into the primitive limbic system. And so these are things that get triggered by the environment and, and where there's a sequencing of information that is passed down from the amygdala to the hypothalamus that then sends the, 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 the uh, through the sympathetic nervous system, triggers the body into flight, fight, freeze mode. Um, and so please under, understand that this is not something, as I mentioned before, that is conscious or intentional. It's the brain that is pushing the child to react in a certain way, given the trigger and the stress response. And this is the same to all children. And so even if we have a student that we're working with that is hypersensitive, either gifted or autistic, the brain still works in the same way in that respect. The other piece um, that's important to understand is that the brain takes time to develop. And so a child is not born with all of their capacity. This is something that comes with time. And the more a child is sensitive, and so thinking about those autistic children that we're working with, these are children for whom at five, they may not have the same development as a neurotypical child, because given sometimes the overwhelm of the environment from the sensory and from the emotions that are really intense, this plays a role where when the child's hijacked in their brain with survival or overstimulation, the, the capacity to focus on maturation takes a sideline. Um, and so for a neurotypical child, by, you can see here by preteen and especially by teen years and, and of course in their 20s, do they really get full capacity? And this is in best conditions. I say this all the time when I present, it's not because we're getting older that we are necessarily getting more mature. And so being more mature is not something, it, it, it's not something that's inevitable. It requires good conditions. And so, of course, a child who's underneath that umbrella of the sensitivity has a harder time to be able to build that capacity in the prefrontal cortex, and it means that their maturation rhythm is much slower. So for those students, rather than being able to have access to not just the limbic system that's being triggered, but to have the prefrontal cortex that helps to slow down the reaction for the student to be less impulsive, they don't have that same capacity to be able to filter and it's more of a no filter type of reaction. Um, and so that's why oftentimes when we're working with students, uh, and I don't wanna generalize, but, but for, for, you know, for some students, it is more difficult for them to be able to temper some of these impulses. So the big question that I get from participants often is, so how does behavior change? How do we get a child to act more mature? And so understanding that maturation is not something that you can teach. It's not something that you can force or impose onto a student. We need to create kind of like a gardener with a plant. We need to be intuitive where we're giving them the good conditions. And it's through the conditions if they're in a good place that then the maturation will unfold spontaneously on its own. And so if we look at what a child needs compared to, for example, a plant who would need water, sun and, and, and soil and so forth, what a child needs is to feel safe, number one, for the body to, to, to not be triggered and, and to be in a stress response. And so if the brain and the body can feel safe, then being in that state of rest can allow for that growth to happen and to get the fruit of the maturation. The other piece is in terms of the adults. And so in order to feel safe, it's not just a question of setting up the environment to look safe, it's also the adults and the way that they interact with the students, with their body language, with, with um, the, the, the things that they say, the tone that they use and so forth, that they're able to engage the child in the relationship to help them feel safe. That has a huge incident on the capacity for a child to feel safe and then in turn to be able to move, fo focus on their growth. And so I'm talking about safety here, but on the other front, 
especially for those vulnerable uh, students, and Andrew will speak more to this a bit later, for those students that are very vulnerable and that tend to put defenses up in their emotions and block down their feelings in order for them to be able to move forward in their maturation, you can't bypass um, in, ahead of the vulnerability and feeling the emotions. That needs to happen first in order for them to have what they need in order to grow. And ultimately, if all of these things are put in place, then maturation can, can unfold. Now, Kim will be giving really good examples on the day-to-day -day practices that adults can do to help students feel safe and to be able to um, have you know, the right parameters and so forth to build that sense of trust and to be able to grow. And so I'll leave that time for her to unfold this. And so I kind of already said it um, you know, through that other slide. So the key elements here are for the child to feel safe, for the attachments to be there, for the emotions to be felt and play uh, which is something that we're, we're not addressing too, too much in this presentation. We could almost have another section at, an all, at another time, but play is another key element where we can allow for students in a non-threatening way to take risks and to try things and to develop their confidence in themselves and to allow for them to grow. And so that plays into it too. And so this, this idea where we want students to be able to reflect and to have good reasoning, we need to understand that that's the last step. In order for them to be able to access their, their cortex, we first need to walk at the, at the root of the brain through the stem. And for our autistic kids, this is where it becomes very challenging because the sensory gating system for, for students on the spectrum doesn't work as well as for neurotypical students. And this has an incident on then the input into the brain and whether the brain is being flooded by, by the, the stimuli in the environment. I'll show you another picture just to kind of explain a little more what I mean. So you have here at the top a neurotypical student that has a good working sensory gating system and, it, and is able, when there's a lot of noise around them, whether it is visual stimuli, auditory stimuli, or, or whatever types of stimuli, a good functioning sensory gating system, the student is able to block out the noise and to focus on that one stimuli that is the one that they need to focus on. But a student for whom their sensory gating system is impaired and not functioning um, at an ideal capacity, what happens for those students is that their brain gets flooded with information. And so the auditory and the visual, anything that's from the senses, and by the way, in terms of the senses, it's not just the external senses, it's also the internal senses. And so if they're tired, if they're hungry, if they're feeling pain, all of that has an impact on, on, on bringing in additional information to over flood the brain. And so for our, our little guys that we're working with on the spectrum, this is a huge um, a challenge for them, it becomes a huge obstacle to be able to block out because of the fact that the sensory gaining system is not working as well as for a neurotypical child. And so for those kids, not only uh, are they over flooded in their brain, but they're also quite moved by the in their emotions and in their behavior, they're very pushed by a lot of different information that's coming to them. They get very overwhelmed by that. They can get stuck because if it becomes overwhelmed, if it's here and there, it's one thing, but if they become overwhelmed on a chronic basis, it becomes too much at some point for them to tolerate that every day, all day. And so this is where sometimes for those students, they will, they will defend themselves to be able to survive. And so when there's defenses that are up, then it's more difficult for them to be in touch with themselves and to be able to allow for the emotions to do their job and to be able to build with the maturation. The other piece that I think it's really important to mention here, and it comes more from the adults interventions, oftentimes when adults are working with students that are very intense in their emotions and that are very sensitive and react, you know, almost like a zero to 10, very kind of quick type of impulsive reaction, Oftentimes it destabilizes not just the child, but the adults too. And oftentimes the, the kind of instinctive reaction of the adults is to try to calm the child, to try to find a way to shut down the overwhelm, to try to find a way to fix things and for the child to be quiet, for the child to be happy, for the child to be calm and so forth. And without realizing it, sometimes what we're doing inadvertently is the child is sensing from us that we are being triggered by their triggering. And it, it 
makes them feel uncomfortable and unsafe with us. Not that I'm saying that it's easy to be working with those students, don't get me wrong, on a daily basis, obviously, it's a challenge working, especially with those, those students that have, you know, quite explosive types of reaction, but how can we find a way with the student in the moment to try to temper ourselves to be able to help them bring down some of that overwhelm? Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on this section because I really want to give time for Andrew to speak to this. But I, I wanted to take a second to show you this picture to, to show you the difference between a healthy working brain versus a brain that of a child that has gone through um, a long-term chronic trauma. And please understand that trauma is a, is a word that's often loosely used. When we're thinking trauma, we're thinking of a child who's been beaten or a child who's gone through sexual abuse or some sort of very, you know, uh, atrocious type of environment. And please understand that trauma for a child is not necessarily the event itself. It's how the event impacted the brain. And so if the, the child felt unsafe and, you know, very deeply unsafe for a chronic period of time, it can have an impact just as deeply for a child like that than a child who's gone through, um, you know, the top five, which is the neglect, the, the physical abuse, the emotional abuse, the sexual abuse. All of these things, of course, impact quite a bit in terms of trauma, but it doesn't mean that a child who's going through hardship and, of course, our ASD kids who are overwhelmed on a daily basis with their environment, not being able to block out the noise, having people who don't always, especially if they're nonverbal, where people don't understand what it is that they're trying to convey as information, on a, on a chronic long-term, this can impact in some extent to the development of their brain. And it doesn't mean that they'll have gaps to this extent, but it doesn't mean that they will have a fully functioning, healthy brain either. And so I think that it's important for us to understand that because when the brain is hijacked by alarm and by stress, then this has an impact in terms on some of the portions in the brain. So for example, for the prefrontal cortex, it's more difficult for the for the child who's gone through a traumatic situation to be able to regulate their emotions, to be able to slow them down. And the amygdala, which I had mentioned before in the part of the brain, and I'll just show the picture for a second here, the amygdala is kind of like the smoke detector that sends the signal that there's a danger. And so a child who's gone through trauma um, can have a, an, an amygdala that's decalibrated and that and that kind of reacts intensely very quickly. And so that plays into it. Um, and so ideally that, that you know, is, is what can we set up in the environment to help the student um, feel safe, to be able to bring down the stress in the brain because they do have a double invisible, invisible handicap. And on the one hand, the amygdala gets activated very easily and intensely. And on the other hand, their prefrontal cortex is compromised and so they're losing on both ends. And remember that for you know, students that are on the spectrum where their sensory gating system is compromised, that too plays into it. And so what happens for those kids is that then their brain is caught up in instinct and in a sense of danger and survival, and there isn't room to be reflective and to leave space for the, integ in, uh, the integration. So, um, and I'll finish on this slide and I'll, I'll leave the space for Andrew. I just wanted to speak to for a second on how this plays out on a daily basis, uh, you know, for those students who, who do either have a sensory gating system that's not working well or that there is uh, some compromise in the brain because of history of trauma. Um, and so you have here in the middle a neurotypical child. And we're looking at the bottom here. On a daily, uh, 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 so the level of stress, so from, from, from daily, you know, typical daily challenges to moderate stress to more threatening types of situation. And here we're looking at the state of the brain. And so we're looking at a state of a brain that's calm to being alert, to being alarmed, to being afraid, to being terrorized. And so you can see for a neurotypical child for whom, um, you know, ha has a good capacity to manage to some extent, you could see the proportion of the reaction um, from a daily challenge to a, to a more threatening situation that it's kind of progressing very um, proportionately. Now you can see here up here, these are our sensitized kids. 
So the kids that are under the umbrella of the hypersensitivity, including students that are ASD, and thinking about the compounding of the trauma, you see how quickly, just in the daily, the daily challenges, how quickly the amygdala gets kicked off and that they, the students very easily are in a state of alarm and, and alert and a fearness. And then it doesn't take much before they are at the top here. Now, the third that you see down here is, is a student who's resilient. So it's not necessarily a student who's, we're not comparing neurotypical versus a neurodivergent. We're looking at, at all students put together, but the difference here is that we're looking at students for whom we've built the sense of resiliency. And resiliency is, is the key. And so if we can help students feel safe, if we can help students express whatever it is that they need to let out because it's, it's kind of contained, and, and that they're able to discover their strength through play and so forth, this is what gives them the confidence to be able to confront daily challenges. And so you could see at the bottom here for those students that they have a better capacity to manage on a daily basis in the classroom. It's only when things get more threatening that of course their reaction is proportionately um, normal given the situation. And so this is what we want. We want to be able to help students manage in the classroom on a daily basis. Andrew? Thank you, Catherine. So um, Catherine's been speaking toward the end of her presentation just about that sort of the state of the brain and how that plays out in terms of uh, what we might see in working with students with behavioral difficulties or with autism spectrum disorders. Um, one of the things that's happened over the last um, couple of decades, I think for those of us that work with students with autism spectrum disorders, what we're seeing is um, an increase in those kids with autism who also have a co-occurring condition. So some of the more challenging cases now are not just the students who are more intellectually limited and have more a higher level of ASD symptomatology. Sometimes the more challenging students that we're dealing with are those that are higher functioning, but for whom um, there are other problems that are co-occurring with their autism. So the autism is part of the symptom picture, but there's a separate condition, an example of a co-occurring condition or comorbid condition would be ASD, or sorry, ADHD and ASD. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is another co-occurring condition, which would be the experience of trauma, more particularly developmental trauma. Um, so what you see in front of you with this slide is the idea that there's three general types of trauma. And, and depending on you know, who's speaking and what you're reading on in, in research or on, on Google, um, it may be unclear which form of trauma we're talking about. So type one trauma is acute trauma and it's kind of the PTSD version of trauma. So it results from exposure to a single overwhelming event or experience like a car accident, a natural disaster, a single incident of assault, for example, uh, witnessing an act of violence. So the, the event itself is limited. It's not ongoing, it's time limited. So that's type one. Type two is a repetitive trauma. Uh, it results from exposure to multiple chronic or prolonged overwhelming events. So receiving regular invasive treatment for an illness would be an example of that. Being uh, at war would be another example of repetitive or type two trauma. Type three trauma, which is really gonna be my emphasis today is developmental trauma. And that results from early onset exposure to ongoing or repetitive relational trauma. So that's an infant, as a child, as a teenager. Next slide, please. And when we look at the long-term impact of trauma, what we see is it gets more impactful as we move from impersonal to attachment. So impersonal trauma with a non-humid agent would be an example like being caught in a hurricane, right? The hurricane's not happening to you personally, and the agent, the cause of the problem is not, not an individual, but the environmental circumstance. So then the next, you know, as we move along that continuum, the next level would be interpersonal trauma with a human agent. So that would be like getting mugged, for example. So it's personal and interpersonal, um, and the, pers the cause of the, of the trauma is another individual. The most severe in terms of long-term impact is actually attachment trauma. That's where um, an attachment figure, you know, someone that's very close to us, um, is treating us in a very problematic way. You know, the, the obvious ones would be abuse, uh, but things like emotional neglect, emotional abuse would also fall into this category. So if we think of over time, people tend to recover less well from the attachment trauma than they do from 
impersonal trauma, like a hurricane. Um, and so that, that's an important thing, I think, for us to keep in mind when we're working with uh, students with autism who are, who are having difficulty, that sometimes the, the bigger element of their difficulty isn't the autism itself, but the comorbid condition. Um, next slide. So this is a quote from Bessel van der Kolk. Um, it from, comes from his book, The Body Keeps the Score. Uh, van der Kolk is one of the foremost experts in, in North America on developmental trauma. And he says that developmental trauma is probably the single most important public health challenge in North America, a challenge that has the potential to be largely resolved by appropriate prevention and intervention. Each year, more than 3 million children are reported to authorities for abuse or neglect in the US, and about a million of those cases are substantiated. Most trauma begins at home. The vast majority of people responsible for child maltreatment are the children's own parents or caregivers. So that's about four times out of five. Um, so next slide, please. So this idea of uh, attachment figures mistreating kids, uh, developmental trauma is a super powerful predictor of poor physical and mental health later in life. Um, it also impedes children's social, emotional behavior and academic functioning in the here and now. One of the challenges historically with developmental trauma is we're aware that it exists um, and we're concerned about it, but it was hard to quantify it. Like, how do we measure it? So how, how do we know whether a child has experienced developmental trauma and how do we know what, to what degree? Um, and the answer to that question came from a study that wasn't at all intended to address developmental trauma. Um, it came from a study called the Adverse Childhood Events or Experiences Study, the ACES study, uh, that's sometimes referred to as the most important public health study you may not have heard of. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the work of Folletti and Amanda, and you know the more recent publication is 2002. The title of their, of their research was The Relationship Between Adverse Childhood Experiences and Adult, Ad and adult Health, or Turning Gold into Lead began in 1995 and it was being done at the Center for Preventive Medicine in San Diego uh, at an HMO, which in the States is a health management organization. So like a big insurance company provider that brings uh, a large number of people together um, um, to, to provide follow-up support for medical conditions. Um, so this particular study followed 17,000 plus participants over 15 years. Um, it's important to know that this sample was about three quarters white, about three quarters of the sample attended university and the average age was 57 years. So we're not talking about a, a population where socioeconomic status was low, where they were compromised uh, by disadvantaged conditions. This is a, you know, this is a well, fairly well off sample that, that, that was examined. Next slide, please. Um, Initially, the authors were interested in the HMO's weight loss programs dropouts. So they were running a, a program for members of this, the health maintenance organization. And what they were offering was support to lose weight. And they found over the course of this um, study that people were, who were actually effectively losing weight uh, would drop out of the study. And so they became interested in why would people for whom the the intervention is working, want to drop out of the study. So they did detailed interviews with them. And what they found was that the people that were dropping out despite being successful uh, were disproportionately reporting to them that they'd had the experience of childhood abuse. Um, and some of them really were able to make that association clearly for the, for the researchers, the link between their obesity and the childhood abuse. And so kind of counterintuitively, they were sharing the idea that the, their obesity was not a problem, uh, but rather a protective solution. And a remark that kind of speaks to that from one of the participants who was raped and gained 115, 105 pounds in the next year was overweight is overlooked and that's the way I needed to be. So for her, this was a way of reducing the risk of that abuse. Um, so coming from this sample of 17,000 people, they, they looked at 10 core events that for them were really key elements or key categories of developmental trauma. Um, so I'll, I'll read to you what they were. And if you, you want, if you think of some of the most challenging cases that you've dealt with 
um, in your work. You know, the kids that really did not respond to intervention very well were difficult to form and maintain relationships with. You know, choose choose one in your imagination from that from that experience, and then think along as I read the questions whether this was this was true or not for that likely for that for that person. Um, did you feel that you didn't have enough to eat? Uh, had to wear dirty clothes, had no one to protect or take care of you? Did you lose a parent through divorce, abandonment, death, or other reason? And what, what we mean here by lose is that the divorce resulted in the, one of the parents no longer being a very active part of the child's life. Do you live with anyone who, did you live with anyone who was depressed, mentally ill, or attempted suicide? Did you live with anyone who had a problems with drinking or using drugs, including prescription drugs? Did your parents or adults in your home hit, punch, uh, beat, or threaten to harm each other? Did you live with anyone who went to jail or prison? Did a parent or adult in your home ever swear at you, insult you, or consistently put you down? Did a parent or adult in your home ever hit, beat, kick, or physically hurt you in any way? Did you feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were special? Did you experience unwanted sexual contact um, or abuse? So you can see there, there are 10 questions or 10 categories. Uh, next slide, please. And they basically, uh, fall into three broad categories. So abuse, physical, emotional, sexual, neglect, physical and emotional, and household dysfunction. So mental illness in a caregiver or parent, an incarcerated parent or relative, close relative, mother who's a victim of domestic violence, uh, parents who abuse substances or alcohol, and divorce resulting in one of the parents essentially being lost to the child. When, uh, so when we score the ACEs, each trauma counts as one, no matter how many times it, it's occurred. So the total range, the most you can score on, on the ACEs scale is, is a 10. So whether the child's been you know, physically abused one time or 10 times, it still scores as one. Um, and what we know from the ACEs score um, is that the higher your ACEs, the, the greater the risk for chronic physical disease, mental illness, violence, and being the victim of violence. And ACEs have a, what's called a graded dose response. And what that means is that as the dose of the drug increases, the intensity of the response increases. So kind of like alcohol, right? You can have one drink and be very good company, two drinks, now you're quite humorous, three drinks or more, and it starts to become, you know, less, less, less good company for those around you. So when we're looking at ACEs, a score of four or more among adults is, is really the, cut, the cutoff point in terms of uh, very severe physical and mental health consequences going forward. For children, um, in the middle of childhood, having three ACEs or more is, is the cutoff point in terms of when we're going to see uh, the child's function be very impacted. And one thing to note is that people with an ACE score of six or higher and are at risk for having their lifespan shortened by 20 years. So again, as the ACEs go up, the more compromised our adaptation is going to be. And these are just some of the, some of the things that, you know, so ACEs studies have been done in all 10 provinces and all 50 states in Europe, and the results are consistent. When we get above four or more, we see an incredible increase in the risk of, uh, of mental and physical health difficulties. So a big one there, with an ACEs of four or more, the person is 15 times more likely to commit suicide. You know, two and a half times more likely to smoke, three times more likely to have serious job performance issues, three times more likely to be depressed, three times more likely to be absent from work, four times more likely to inject drugs, four times more likely to uh, have an STD, four times more likely to be an alcoholic. So the trauma is intertwined with attachment, right? So that it, Attachment template, whether we trust and feel secure in the company of others or whether we feel insecure, unwanted, unloved, the more of these ACEs a person experiences, the less secure and stable their, their attachment is going to be. And the nature of attachment is that template is unconscious and we carry it with us from one relationship to the next. And it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy for us. Um, when we look at the impact of childhood trauma, you can see the seven different categories there and, and how significant in, in all these different ways, you know, developmental trauma affects brain size and resulting in kids having smaller brain size. Um, with behavior, we certainly see the consistent difficulties with self-regulation, with poor impulse control, with aggression. Mental health, you know, as I said, we see the comorbidity with depression, with anxiety, 
um, with suicide attempts. Relationships are problematic. Emotions are problematic. Physical health is affected. Cognition is affected. So kids in class who have been experienced developmental trauma are not as ready to learn. They have greater difficulties with problem solving. They have tr more trouble with, with concentration. Language can be delayed. So whether or not, uh, next slide please. Whether or not a child uh, has experienced developmental trauma is really relevant for us in figuring out how best to support them um, and, you know, and, and accommodate in, in the school environment. One of the things uh, that struck me about the ACES study, so again, we're looking at 17,000 plus middle-class participants. Um, and of that group, 13% of the female participants reported emotional abuse during childhood, 27% physical abuse, 25% sexual abuse. So one in four in that sample, again, of, of, of a fairly middle-class sample are reporting sexual abuse. Um, and for male participants, the physical abuse is at 30% and the sexual abuse is at 16%. So what jumped out at me was just how much more common um, these kinds of developmentally traumatizing incidents are for a lot of, a lot of you know, a lot of our kids and a lot of the families that we support in our work. So when it comes to developmental trauma and ASD, what the evidence shows is that students with ASD are at least as likely to experience developmental trauma as neurotypical kids. And may in fact, that the new research that's coming out suggests that they're probably at greater risk for ACEs. So rather than being protected in some way, um, ASD students are just as likely at a minimum to be dealing with the kinds of things that I you just ran through um, on, on the preceding slides. So, you know, a child is not managing and our, our interventions aren't working, best practices interventions are not working. Well, one of the questions is, could we be dealing with an ASD student who's also uh, a, a victim of developmental trauma? Um, we're not exactly sure what this, whether there are unique or specific events, like effects of developmental trauma on ASD students. It's just kind of an emerging area of research right now. But we do know um, that less extreme experiences than ACEs, like fire alarms, the loss of a pet, um, can be quite destabilizing for those students with ASD. So sub-trauma experiences, you know, that are negative and disruptive, uh, lead to strong reactions in ASD students. So it begs the question, what do ACEs lead to in ASD students? Um, we know that about 70% of students with ASD have a comorbid psychiatric disorder. And I mentioned, you know, ADHD is a common one. Anxiety is a common one. Uh, you know, language-based di dis disorders are common uh, with students with ASD. We haven't done a lot of work research to know how common type one, type two, and type three trauma is. So PTSD and DTD there is developmental trauma disorder. Um, but it does seem, um, you know, until recently, sorry, very few studies looked at the relationship be between these two conditions. And it was, to me, quite underestimated at 3%, you know, saying that 3% of ASD students had developmental trauma. More contemporary research is certainly showing that as I said before, that it, ASD students are at least as likely to experience trauma as neurotypical students. The other thing we do know, and this, this is where a lot of the new research is coming out, is that the effect of being bullied and ostracized socially, uh, more off, it happens more often to ASD students than their neurotypical peers, and to students with other disabilities that aren't autism. So in other words, the ASD student is the most likely of any group uh, to, be the, to be on the receiving end of bullying or social ostracism. And that we do know that this social ostracism or bullying is a very potent trauma trigger among students with ASD. So that piece, you know, as we work with students in inclusive environments, um, there's a lot of advantages to it. But one of the things it does is it, it opens up children, particularly children whose disability is, is hidden like a student with Asperger's, for example, it opens them up to that peer ostracism and bullying, which may be an, a big factor um, in their reactions and in their difficulties, um, the difficulties managing them within the regular environment. You know, we're, 
we're looking, you know, when we're supporting students, we're looking at this idea of how do we co-regulate, right? How do we as adults in the school environment help them navigate, manage their emotions through our support? So Kim is going to speak to that in a lot of different ways, um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to her. Thank you, Andrew. So what are some challenges that ASC students can face during their day? If we think about how they navigate throughout their day, definitely change and unpredictability is almost inevitable throughout their day. Unstructured time, so we often see recess, phys ed, uh, those times, lunch periods, after school daycare, um, social interactions, social demands, a sensory buildup of their day, uh, hunger, fatigue, unwell, anticipation of the day, the afternoon, or even going home, right? Sometimes we see those students that um, the end of the day is coming and they're worried about, am I going to mom's? Am I going to dad's? Is a grandma who's picking me up? Or even uh, after a Friday, you know, they're anticipating the weekend or upon return of March break or before the summer. They're just anticipating all those changes that will happen if the routine um, transitions. So often, you know, before or after recess, before or after lunch, uh, demands or requests, and also just the inability to self-regulate, and they often need somebody to help them co-regulate. Next slide, please. So um, I put together some best practices that I'm going to talk about, and I've come up with about 10, and that's literally just from basically living and breathing the forefront of the being in the schools and seeing a whole bunch of different situations. These are the 10 that I think are best practices, but they're really um, preventative measures and proactive measures. And I'll go into each one in some detail. Next slide, please. So the first one is building a positive relationship. And I would say that's probably the more crucial one because without that positive relationship with the adult that they spend so much time with, everything else comes from that afterwards, right? So how can we build a positive relationship with the student that we work with? First thing is to listen to them, right? Whether they're communicating through behaviors, through words, through nonverbals, just listening to what they're trying to tell you and what they're trying to communicate to you. Get down to their level, let them know that you're there for them, you hear them, uh, you're listening to them. Play, engage with them, connect with them. Be mindful of your verbal and nonverbal communication, right? Because they pick up on that. So uh, Catherine mentioned this before that sometimes what we're saying or what we're not saying with our words or with our bodies, they could pick up on. And if we're having a bad day or if we're stressed or even if, um, you know, I work with so many students that the adult that works on that with them is literally walking on eggshells. That is perceived and that comes through to them. So just be cautious of how you're communicating with them verbally or non-verbally and respect the student, pay attention to what he's saying to you, whether with verbal words, choices, or actions. The second part is using visual supports. Visuals can help in so many different ways. Um, they decrease stress as students will know what comes next. They give clear expectations, support the student's difficulty with sequential memory and organization of time, eliminate dialogue and the potential dispute. So many times, especially if we have those higher functioning students, they will dispute everything you say. No, I don't want to do this now. What comes next? Well, I want to go to recess now. And then often the adult saying, no, it's not recess time. I need you to do this first. And you get into that dialogue. Just giving them a visual, you can't dispute a visual. The visual stays there. It has lasting effect. You look at it. They're able to process what's written and then they can come around. It promotes independence. Um, and I can't see what's further down. Can you slide up, Catherine? No way. And it, the information lasts longer, right? So when you're speaking to them, the words literally go in and they, they're gone after that. So visuals have a lasting effect and they last a lot longer. Next slide, please. So often I get why use visuals. And if I had a loony for every time I heard this, I would be a millionaire by now. So I don't want him to look different. He already knows what's happening this time. Um, he can never, I can never find the pictures. He never even looks at his schedule. He understands what I'm saying. He speaks, he understands language. Why do I need to use visuals? There's so many reasons to use visuals, right? So we as adults use visuals. When we are online shopping, 
it's all pictures, it's all visuals to us. If we go to a restaurant and we look at the menu, it's pictures of the items that we want to order. If we had to read every single word and look for every single detail, we would lose meaning in half the stuff and we would lose the attention span to even do that. So even as adults, we use visuals. We rely on visuals, we really rely on checklists, on to-do lists. I look at my calendar five to 10 times a day, even though I know my routine. So these are all things that we just need to provide the student with um, to be able to facilitate and help them navigate throughout their day. Next slide, thank you. Um, so like I said, visual supports, it has, it gives the information in a concrete visual form. It decreases anxiety. It lets the student know what is coming and what is not coming. It gives clear expectations and especially it promotes independence. And you'll see on the next slide, thank you. So it's important to mention, because I'm often told that the child speaks and he can follow my instructions. That may be true, but he follows along when he's verbally prompted and he's dependent on that adult who's always by his side to say, go get your backpack, go line up, let's go to music class, take out your book. And when that adult is not there next to them, they become prompt dependent and they're not independent and we're not building autonomy. So when you look at this visual, I think it's very important to notice that visuals is the less intrusive prompt. That's what's building the autonomy. By giving them visuals, we're building their autonomy and we're helping them. They could take visuals with them later on in life as opposed to having an adult that they're relying on by their side. So when staff that works with students tell me why do we need visuals, this is the biggest takeaway that I try telling them is that when they move forward to high school, if they have a visual schedule with them or a to-do list or a checklist, that's completely okay. Like I said, we as adults walk around with our phone to give us all that information. But if they needed an adult to tell them every step away what they have to do, that's not helping and that's not building independence. Next slide, please. So in the next few slide, slides, I show you different visuals that are very helpful in our schools. I really like a regular visual schedule because this shows them what's happening today and what is not happening today. What is the sequence of the events, how they're going to unfold throughout my day? What's changing that I didn't expect? When is it time to stop one activity and move on to another activity? I'll just add to this one that I just worked with a student who would run out of her class to go see a friend in another room. Um, and nobody was understanding why she was running out of the classroom and she was running around the building and going into somebody else's class. She was looking for her friend and wanting to know when she was gonna play with her. So we actually put a picture of her on her visual schedule to show her that it's math, English, reading, and then time to go see Grace. So when she saw that on her schedule, that stabilized her and that helped her to co-regulate because she was not able to regulate on her own. She was in a heightened state all day anticipating when am I going to see my friend. And yes, we're putting um, activities and tasks on the schedule, but you can put in uh, breaks and you can put in movement activities or this time to see her friend. And it just gives her some structure to her day so that she sees the sequence of her events of how they're going to unfold for her day. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just some examples. Um, you'll see on the next slide also that I use the first and then. If you're going to take anything away as a visual, the first and then is the most impactful visual that you can use because you could use it in so many different ways. You you know, for those kids who open up a lunchbox and automatically goes to their snacks and then it's a whole kerfuffle of, no, I need you to eat your sandwich first. And then you're getting into that dialogue that I spoke about before. A simple visual of first sandwich, then snack. Um, you can break up tasks. First clean up, then we go outside. You can give them dressing strips, um, activity strips, anything that just kind of provides them with the sequence and provides them with the structure. My two favorite words that I sound like a broken record whenever I go into my schools are structure and predictability. Our ASD students thrive on structure and predictability. And when you provide them that cocktail of structure and predictability, you see how well they do with their day. And when that, in the lack of the structure and predictability, that's where they go to their default. And then they start doing things to help them regulate, whether stimming or engaging in non maladaptive behaviors. Next slide, please. Um, so we wanna make sure that we structure their environment. 
you can structure their environment in so many different ways. And often we want to look for those little signs. Sometimes more often than not, I'll be told there was no trigger. He just, he just snapped or he just, he just, you know, I asked him to move places and he flipped the table. Often we see a ramping up of those situations, an escalation period where you see them getting a little bit dysregulated. Sometimes it just happens because we don't see everything that happened before. Um, but you could tr try your best to structure the environment by providing clear and concise expectations. We can use the first and then cards like I spoke about before to show them what's coming up, what's the expectation of this activity. You could use the first and then card to break up a task. First, write name, then circle number three. Um, provide opportunities for structured play, right? So sometimes our ASD students have a hard time navigating the schoolyard. Um, and often that's when they'll engage in some inappropriate or unexpected behaviors. But if we provide them with a more structured play and we give them a defined perimeters as to what they can do with their recess, that helps them because we're providing them with that structure and that predictability. Eliminate the unknown as much as possible, right? Like I'll go into classrooms and the student will be doing the work, but when the work is finished, they kind of sit there aimlessly and they don't know what to do with that paper that they just finished. Um, I also worked with a student where he was in art class and he had his art and then we brought him back into the classroom. And when he walked back into the classroom, he ran over to the teacher and he started flipping chairs. And right away, the teacher was like, whoa, whoa, you need to get him out of the class. But he walked in and he was unsure of what to do with the art paper that was in his hand. So he was trying to regulate and trying to figure out information. And the next time we were out of the class, we prepared them ahead of time. We're going to walk into class. You're going to look for your red bin and put it in your bin. And providing him with that structure and eliminating the unknown, because often that unknown is, like I said, when they go to their default and they'll engage in more um, maladaptive behaviors at the time. Differential seating could be an easy one, right? Oftentimes, like another thing is I go into classrooms and you have a student who is hyperactive and uh, doesn't have much attention, but he's sitting in the back of the class and it's very difficult for him to see the teacher. And in order for him to see the teacher, there's like 25 heads in front of him that are all moving and consistently moving all over the place. So it's going to be tons of distractions for him. Um, a student who needs many breaks, you know, sit them closer to the door so they have easy access to the door. Um, so those are just little tweaks that you can do in the environment that sometimes goes a long way. Use peers as positive role models. I love this one because often it's always an adult who's telling the student what to do or trying to get that student to get dressed to go outside for recess. And they're like beating their head up against the wall. They're like, oh, he's just not listening. He's not just listening. But then a friend comes along like, Johnny, let's go outside and play. Get your jacket on. And the kid's like, okay, let's go. So sometimes just engaging a peer as is, is a better way to engage that student. Or we could also use peers as positive role models. We know that our ASD students like watching and observing. Um, and a lot of times it's that parallel play, but allowing them to look at the model and being able to pick up on those things that they should do. Um, and provide a safe space and teach the student how to use that space, right? So a calming room, a corner, activities, relaxation aids, um, and letting them know preventatively when they can go to this and that it's okay to go to these places. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is a great way of using the first and then card. And I'll just mention that when you're using the first and then card, it's important that you put on it things that are meaningful to the child. Sometimes I see um, first math, then they have a star. What does the star mean? The star means nothing to the student, right? So you want them to actually derive meaning from the visual or from the word that you're putting on, on the first and then card. Um, and the first and then card really provides that predictability. It tells the child what is expected of them now, what's expected of me when I'm done this task. Um, and what they'll get when they move past it. Um, and then you have to think about this almost like a conveyor belt, right? It's almost like a three-step. It's first wash your hands, then eat snack. But if the student doesn't want to eat snack, when the child is transitioning, you have to then show them snack, then outside. So you're keeping the momentum going. It's table work, then iPad. 
and then after iPad, recess. So you're letting them know so they don't get your stuck at that last bit. And then after that second one comes, they kind of sit there. Like I said earlier, you're providing them and filling in that unknown for them all the time. Next slide, please. So this is a quote that I really, really like because I find it just sums up everything that I just said is when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. Then you want to address sensory needs, right? So individuals with autism frequently report on their various ways of experiencing the world. Uh, we know that sometimes they get like literally a sensory overload. Um, and we just, as one of my best practices or proactive measures, you just want to be mindful of that. Um, and those can be things that we may not be able to envision because sometimes they're not things that are so obvious. Um, it can be a buzzing sound from the radiator that we are not intuitive to, or the lighting, sounds, crowds, odors, smells. Um, and then we want to be preventative, right? When we know these things, we could offer them headphones if we know the, the you know, the class might get a little bit rowdy or a fidget toy or that calm down corner that I spoke of earlier. Um, an example of this is also, I was called into a school because they told me the student just refuses to put his snow pants on. He just won't put snow pants on. And it was a battle. They were, literally were engaging in this fighting with him every, every day, forcing him to get it on, pulling them on him, keeping him in for recess. And when I went there, the first thing I said was, why doesn't he want to put his snow pants on? Why? And you're going to see that later on is my why to the behavior. Um, and we found out it was a sensory component that he didn't like the feeling of his pants underneath his snow pants that were rising up whenever he would put his snow pants on. Um, or those students who, you know, he goes outside, puts his mittens on for recess, but in lunch recess, he won't put his mittens on. Well, by lunch recess, the mittens were wet. So he didn't like the feeling of putting his hands in the wet mitten. Um, so just being mindful of that sensory need um, is, is a really big part of it too. Addressing the emotional needs, right? So fight, flight, freeze response is a real, real thing like Catherine mentioned before, right? The student may respond with a dramatic reaction, which would be the fight response, and maintain a high level of arousal or move into shutdown, which would look like a freeze response where they do not appear to be responding to sensory input at all. A student that appears to be avoiding, we get that quite a lot. You know, he just keeps running out of my class. Um, that could actually be a physical, a physiological flight response. He's literally fleeing the situation that is causing him anxiety. Um, so being mindful of the fact that sometimes it's not a choice. It's actually a physiological response that they're encountering. And it's not by, by choice that they're doing this. Next slide, please. Um, teach and model social skills. So children with ASD may need to explicitly be taught things that other students innately learn. Um, another example of that as well, right, is, um, you know, outside for recess, you know, he keeps touching kids and he's going in their personal space and he's, he's bothering them. And then often we'll just, you know, remove recess or keep them in from recess but they have to actually be taught these skills. We can't just assume that they know the right way to play. These things are not innate for some of our ASD students. So they have to explicitly be taught by scripting and modeling, role-playing, leading by example. The other big one that I get is often, I see this all the time is an integration aide will be walking with her students and she'll say, say hi, Johnny. Johnny, say hi to Miss Kim we don't need the student to say hi to Miss Kim, right? But instead, you can model the expected behavior. You know, you can walk by and you can say, oh, good morning, Miss Kim. And then that child will pick up on those social norms without telling him what to do. Next slide, please. So a way to teach social skills is something that this is what I, I use quite regularly. And I put an embedded link on top so you can just it'll click and bring you right to that website, is using thought bubbles in a way to teach our students that their actions and words give people thoughts and feelings. Um, and often, if I script this for them, you know, if a student is saying, oh, this is so stupid, we can tell them, okay, this is making me think that you're being rude and you don't care about what I'm teaching you. And then we want to tell them, is that really what you want me to be thinking right now? And often the student will be like, no, I don't understand this or I don't want to do this. 
And then the message we're getting is, oh, he's confused, he needs help. So scripting for the student, what he's saying and doing is giving me a thought and a feeling and having them have the opportunity to self-correct that. Is that really the thought or the feeling you want me to have? Or you know, a kid that's walking around going bang, bang, bang to his friends and making his friends feel uncomfortable, you could use that opportunity to say, you know, you're making Johnny feel scared. Do you want to be scaring him right now? And then the student will probably say, no, I'm joking. I want him to laugh. And then you can let that student know different ways that maybe he can engage with his peers that can make them laugh and find things funny. So you're just using thought bubbles to map out for the student that his actions and words give people's thoughts and feelings. This is also something that I use quite regularly is to teach the student the size of the problem, right? We wanna teach the students that the size of the problem matches their reactions. Um, you know, small problems have small reactions, big problems, big reactions. The only thing that I would mention here is that is really important that when you're practicing this with the student is when they're actually demonstrating a, 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 there's an incident and they're upset and we're not telling them it's not a big problem because to them in the moment, it is a big problem to them, right? So I often see this, they're like, okay, well, you know what? Like he just took your pencil away. What size problem is that? That's a small problem. And then the child's like, no, it's a big problem. And they're having a big, tan big tantrum. We want to be mindful of the fact that in the moment, this is a big problem for the student. The student doesn't yet have the teaching where they're able to differentiate the different sizes of their problem. That's where this teaching comes in, where proactively and preventatively, we can teach them scenarios and what reactions match those problems. Um, because often in the moment, every problem seems like a huge problem to these students, and we want them to be able to differentiate their reactions to the size of their problems that they encounter throughout their day. And then expected and unexpected behavior, right? This in most of my schools is a universal language, um, and we're teaching them that expected uh, behaviors give people positive thoughts and feelings about you and unexpected behaviors give people uncomfortable thoughts and feelings about you. So, and then that could be used in a whole bunch of different scenarios as well, right? Like um, if you're doing a class lesson and then the teacher uh, student just yells out and tells you, you know, yesterday I got bitten by a mosquito and it's not relevant. The answer can be like, well, that's unexpected because we're not talking about mosquitoes right now. But if we were talking about insects and bites, that would be very expected. So thank you for sharing. So you're just telling them what's unexpected and what's expected per context, right? Yelling and screaming is unexpected now in the classroom, but it may be expected if you were very surprised at a birthday party and you know you were playing with your friends. So you're not teaching them that the behaviors are wrong or good or bad. It's expected and unexpected per environment and per context. I also gave you a, a link there that you can view at, at your, on your own and be able to see, read more about this if you'd like. So then this is my, I can do a whole presentation on just this slide, is understanding the root cause driving the behavior. Think of the behavior you observe as just the tip of the iceberg. Below the surface is the waterline, the, uh, the cause of the behavior. We need to dive down below the waterline to address the root cause not simply the behavior that we're seeing. So this one, it, it, every time I go into a school and they, they call me in for um, a student who's running out of the class or who punched or who did this, my question will always be, why? So why is he running out of the class? Why is she refusing to do the worksheet? Why will he not put his snow pants? Why is he kicking, punching, hitting? Getting to the root cause and the why is the biggest part of really making meaningful change and helping the child navigate their day and helping them to co-regulate. If we only address the behavior that we're seeing, it doesn't lead to meaningful change. Next slide, please. So our current approach in education is very much a surface level approach. We identify the behavior and then we intervene. What's missing? is the underlying emotions and or the environmental factors driving the behavior. And that's what I hope you guys take away from this presentation today is when you're addressing a behavior with a student is take the time 
to look at what do you think is the driving factor, the underlying emotional or environment factor that is fueling this behavior. It's easy to get caught up on he's kicking, he's yelling, he's, he's disruptive, but we need to figure out why. And my example that I give to this in order to make any meaningful change, because we could, I'll, I'll let you go to the next slide just so that you see. So examples of what we currently do of sur surface level approaches is loss of privileges, uh, use of a strong reinforcer, planned ignoring, removal from the classroom. Those are typical in all our schools because we're addressing just the behavior that we see, right? So a student who misbehaves at recess, we might remove recess. That's not teaching the social skills that we spoke about earlier, right? Maybe he's misbehaving at recess because he really lacks those skills to interact and make his friends laugh and initiate play with his friends. So just removing him from recess, we're not getting to the root cause. So surface level approaches focus literally on the observable behavior and it fixes what the behavior looks like. These strategies might extinguish negative behaviors in the short term, but they do not help us understand and get to the real authentic problem. An example that I give of that one, so I'm just gonna say something before I go into this slide. An example that I give for that is if you think about, um, a, let's say I wake up in the morning, my morning routine is I rush out, I make my coffee, I, get, I do everything and then I drive to work and I happen to get a speeding ticket. That will really irritate me. I will not want this, the speeding ticket. That's a negative consequence. I don't have the financial means to pay for that right now. It's not something I want to do. So for the next few days, every time I drive down that street, I'm going to make sure to reduce my speed because I don't want that speeding ticket. That's a surface level approach. You might have extinguished my behavior of speeding because I don't want the ticket. But after a few days of me not getting that ticket, I'm gonna to go to my old ways again. And I'm gonna to continue to speed down that street because I haven't fixed the root cause of my problem. To fix the root cause and the developmental approach to that same situation would be to look at my morning schedule and change my morning routine. Maybe make wake up 15 minutes earlier so that I don't have to rush and speed down my street. So adjusting my schedule and waking up 15 minutes earlier would be a developmental approach Whereas just slowing down because I know the cop is sitting there is a surface level approach. Next slide, please. So assume competency, tap into strengths and interests and not deficits. So, so many of our ASD students have things that they are really, really passionate about. Um, they might have restrictive interests. Um, and often that could be a source of frustration for a lot of the adults who work with them because their, their interests are so limited. But what I'm saying is tap into those interests. Uh, Dr. Barry Prison said it so amazingly, and this really stuck with me, is that see them as enthusiasms instead of obsessions, right? So if a student is enthusiastic about rockets, and if you're doing a writing piece where the goal is to see if they can do descriptive writing and you know give you the adjectives and write descriptively, letting them write about rockets, they probably will be able to do that competency and show you descriptive writing. But forcing them to write about a time that they encounter an alien in space is not something that they could relate to. It's not something they're interested in. And then they might have more difficulties writing about that. So just take those strengths and celebrate those strengths and those successes. Um, a student who you know really likes routine and rituals and likes things neat and orderly, instead of you know trying to break that rigidity, give him a task in the classroom where it's his job to push in all the chairs when everybody gets up and lines up, right? So use those strengths and use those successes and capitalize on them. Use that as what you could where what you can do to bring that student to the next level as opposed to seeing those things as obstacles or as uh, boundaries for you. Use those and capitalize on them because they can really go a long way. Okay, this is another favorite one of mine. Um, if you think about our ASD students or any student for that matter, when they're in school, we're often met with telling them, uh, time to line up, go get your bag, go get this, take out your book. What do we do next? So I'm saying if you take anything away from this workshop again, is using the first and then card, and using declarative language and then what's coming up on another slide. Those three elements 
for me are the biggest impact when I go into schools. If I just apply those three, I see a difference. Declarative language versus imperative language. Um, so declarative language is basically commenting, making a reflection, a prediction. And declarative language does not elicit, require, or demand a physical or verbal response, but rather declarative language invites a response. Whereas imperative language, you're expecting a response, either physical or verbal. And so, you know, go line up, you're expecting them to go line up. Um, using declarative language really goes a long way with ASD students, especially with students that have a bit of opposition, where you feel like you're always hitting that wall with them and getting into that power struggle. Using declarative language is so powerful because it takes away the pressure of a student having to do something because you've asked them or you're expecting it. So it takes away for any anxiety or any pressure. Next slide, please. So why use declarative language? Using declarative language can make a huge difference in the student's ability to share experiences and memories, become better observers. It helps them to read the room, problem solve, develop their critical thinking skills, understand perspective, and communicate on a more meaningful level. On the next slide, you'll see I provided you guys with a whole bunch of examples because it's not natural for us to use declarative language, right? Especially as educators, as parents, we often want to tell somebody what to do or ask a question. So it takes a lot of practice to tweak what you say and, and use declarative language. But I swear to all of you that using declarative language, you will see a difference. And it's not just with ASD students. I use it at home with my own family with my husband and it works magic, right? So instead of saying, oh, will you take out the garbage or can you take out the garbage? The garbage is here again. And it sounds like you're nagging and you're making them do something. A simple thing like, oh, the garbage stinks, gets my husband to take out the garbage. So little things like instead of uh, go put your shoes on, just saying, I wonder where your shoes are or I wonder where your pencil is as opposed to go take out your pencil or zip up your bag you can say oh i'm afraid your bag your books will fall out of your bag right so if you take some time to read over these i think you're really really going to like them because you're going to see the power that they have and they're almost like so clever that you're going to enjoy doing it because you're going to see the effect that it has it, it's it's magic this stuff and then emotion coaching. So emotion coaching has five steps. And what I've done was I've broken it down for you and given you examples because I wanted to leave you today with almost like um, a narrative that you could use when you encounter some difficulties with your students. So emotion coaching, coaching has five steps. The first being label, the second validate, third set limits, the fourth, you can go to the next slide is problem solve and then coach a skill. So when you, I think you can go to the next one because it's gonna summarize all of it. So when to use emotion coaching, emotion coaching can be used to de-escalate a situation before it uh, turns into a crisis. And it also could be used to debrief the child after a crisis has occurred. So I'll give you an example. I broke it down just to put it into a, like a more meaningful example for you of how it's applied in a real life situation. So I had a student who lost a glove outside at recess, and then he got very fixated on the fact that he couldn't find his glove, and then the bell rang and he refused to come in. And then everybody was in an uproar and they thought, oh, he was being so behavioral and so oppositional and he just ignored the bell and he wouldn't come in. Um, so when we got to the root cause of the behavior, we realized that he was really disoriented and upset that he did not know where his glove was. So to him, that problem was not resolved, right? He lost his glove. He didn't know where it was. And then the bell rang and you're asking him to just put that all aside and forget that he's lost his glove and come back in and, and regain focus and continue with his day. So that certain episode ended up turning into a big behavior because he came in, he didn't feel like the teachers understood him and he got quite aggressive and it escalated. But what that scenario could have looked like when using emotion coaching is first the label. I see that you're worried that your glove is missing. Then we would have gone on to validate. I would be worried too if I didn't know where my glove was and then set limits. It's okay to be worried and want to look for your glove, but it's not okay to ignore the bell when the bell rings. 
and then problem solve. At our next recess, what do you think about me going outside with you and helping you look for your glove? And then coach a skill. Next time you're worried about your gloves, you can come see me and let me know that you're worried about them. Or next time you take your gloves off, perhaps you can put them in your pocket so you don't misplace them. You're kind of coaching a skill and helping them work through what had just happened. So label, validate, set limits, problem solve, and co coach a skill. And on the previous slides that you saw, there's a little script to adhere to. So when you are encountering a situation with a student, if you even just go through these five steps, it provides you with a little bit of a narrative that hopefully will be a takeaway from today's presentation that you feel a little bit empowered to be able to have that dialogue with your students. Andrew, do you want to say something? Yeah, just to, just to go back to your emotion coaching. One of the things we often do as adults is we intervene at level three, at step three. Right? We often will skip uh, attending to the underlying emotion that's motivating the behavior um, and therefore don't speak to it, which means we don't validate it. And we just come in to try and set a, set a, set a limit or problem solve. If you imagine yourselves as, as, as adults, you know, the, someone who speaks to your underlying emotion, whether it's anxiety, you know, frustration, whatever it might be, and then validates that is going to invite you to sort of let down your defenses and, and move toward a cooperative, collaborative stance. If somebody is just telling you what to do, whether that's to set a limit or how to solve your problem, um, you're, you're going to be much less inclined to receive that. Your defenses are going to be up and you're going to be resistant, right? And so that's often sort of the stereotypical uh, male way of, of problem solving or helping people, right? Is to come in and, you know, oh, all the emotional stuff doesn't matter. You just need to solve the problem. You just need to do this. And you can imagine that's typically not a very successful uh, collaborative intervention. Right, Andrew, to your point, that's exactly what happened in the situation I told you where it did escalate because the teachers were upset that the student didn't come in and listen to the bell and they came in right at the point of it's not okay to not listen to the bell. And then they addressed the observable behavior. The observable behavior was ignoring the bell. And then they jumped in right at that point. All right, next slide, please. So this scale um, just kind of shows you like the progression that what happens with a student who is dysregulated. And I just want to mention that all the 10 steps that I had just spoken about all happen in the one, two, and three part. So that's the optimal time to do those proactive preventative measures. And you'll see on the next slide, so everything that we had just mentioned, all 10 is at the one, two, and three mark. And then on the next slide, you'll see that, that the four and five is when we don't, we're not using those preventive, they're no longer preventative. At the four and five part, that's where it's now at the reactive state. We're allowing this to play out. The student might need help co-regulating because they might not be able to self-regulate on their own. Um, but at this part, this is where we're not doing over-talking because they're not available to listen to you at this point. This is where we want to limit the dialogue not go into over-talking. We want to just ensure the student's safety, ensure the class's safety, ensure your own safety, and preserve the student's dignity and allow for the outburst to conclude. And then when it comes back down, that's the time to follow up and do the, the follow-through, reconnect, and foster any relationship that was affected by the student's behavior. And I would say that's the most important piece, right? We want to make sure that we preserve the relationship. Because when you go back to my first part of the building a relationship, we want to make sure that that's preserved. That is what we have to make sure did not sever or have any ties broken. And we want that student to know that that did not change our perception of them, our feelings towards them, and that the environment in which this happens is still a safe environment for the students. Um, so preserving that relationship is a huge, huge part of that scale. And you'll see also on the next slide of, of that curve, right? So the proactive measures on the left is everything that I had mentioned, all the preventative measures, all those best practices. Then if it happens that it goes to the top part, the peak, the reactive state, and then all those measures come back into play for the post-reaction part. If I may add, Kim, I think the other piece too that we need to be mindful in terms of the stress curve is not just where the student is at, but where the adult is at as well, especially with a child who has a history of trauma and that is very sensitive to the adult's tone or nonverbals. 
sometimes it's important for us to keep ourselves in check. And if we're not in a good place to be able to address the students, this is where let's work as a team. Who else is available to be able to 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 help out? And and you know maybe the student needs a break. Maybe the adult needs to go and step in and work with another student while another adult steps in and so forth. And so it's so so central, not just for the child themselves, but for for us too. And so when we're talking about emotion regulation, the 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 self regulation piece, which is what ideally we want for the child eventually. It's the, the first part is co-regulation and co-regulation starts with the adult too being regulated. And so we're working together on that and we're coaching them. We were talking about the emotion coaching before Kim, but you know, the adult too needs to be in a good place when they're doing that step-by-step -step piece. Uh, if you're upset yourself, it's kind of hard to be, to be more reflective in your, in your approach. So we need to be mindful of our own state too. Yeah, and that's where that comes into play. Also, you know, you can see it part of that curve, but what I had first mentioned in the step one about being mindful of your verbal and nonverbal communication that you're showing the student, that comes into play in an in a time like this. So all interactions should be aimed at developing the student's autonomy, not obedience, be based on acceptance of the students, including his or her autistic traits be about what the child needs, not necessarily what we need, be about what we should do, not necessarily what the student should do, and be meaningful and functional. And in conclusion, visual supports are very powerful and a very effective tool, so please use them. Decipher between skill deficits and motivational deficits, right? So oftentimes I'm told, oh, he can do it. He just is choosing not to. I can clean my house also, and I choose to not clean my house sometimes, right? So being told, oh, he can do it. Yes, he can do it, but maybe he just needs a few strategies to help him do it, right? I can clean my house, but if you break down the task and tell me first start with the dishes and then move on to the vacuuming, I, may, I feel a lot more successful and it's less daunting to me. So figure out whether it's a skill deficit or just motivational deficit address the why of the behavior in order to make any meaningful change. The measure of a good day is not the absence of negative behaviors. Build a relationship and preserve student dignity and pro promote student autonomy. And that's it for me. And so this was just, uh, you know, for people to, to know that on our websites, we do have access to more resources. You've got the addresses here. You will be getting the handout. I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing. You will be getting the, the handout after the presentation. Um, we had a couple good comments and a few questions. Um, just wanted to go to the comments because they were really easy to say. Uh, there's a few people that did really appreciate um, the dec declarative language, Kim. They were saying that they did feel that it was quite um, helpful. Somebody talked about the first and then, and to have the until in between that sometimes using a time timer to help students understand how long is the first so they know for the den for the then. And so, so there was a few comments on that in the chat. Um, so here's a question. Uh, what if the, he or she is still fixated on getting the glove even after they are told that he or she will get help next recess? Is the best thing to to then to allow them to continue looking? I guess it may depend on the student. At times like that, I'd probably use a consequence map, right, to show them what's happening and what how to help them move on, right? So, either using the first and then at that time, but helping them realize if we stop now and go look for the glove, there's going to be things that are going to be missing in your schedule. Right, because often what will happen is they'll go look for their glove and then when they come back and realize I missed art class or I missed gym class that will spiral and, and cause a secondary problem for them. But letting them have that choice that we can go look for your glove now and then you know you might find your glove and then we're going to move on but gym class is going to be finished or we go to gym class and then it'll be recess and we can go look for your glove. So mapping out for them the consequences mm -hmm. and the contingency of what happens within their perimeter and then ultimately letting them choose, right? So we could go look for your glove, but it might mean that you're missing gym class. Um, another good question that I see here in the, the Q&A is, so how do we communicate effectively with, a, with an ESD student who, for whom English or French is not their first language or who's nonverbal? So the language, I think there's other ways of communicating besides the language, right? So using visuals, pictograms, you know, like pictures, 
don't have a language base to it. So um, I also, there's lesson picks that I'm not sure that's on one of the slides, but lesson picks has some great visuals. That is a great way to communicate. And then there's different devices. The ASC core board from Boardmaker has a lot of good pictos. And sometimes we use that with our nonverbal students who are e even not English or French speaking. Um, and you're kind of just giving them a different platform and a different way to communicate. And sometimes we have to, we have to think past the fact of it just being language based communication. It, there's many forms of communication and doesn't only stem from language. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that, that I get, but I, I, I guess it's a difficult one to answer here, but it's talking about how to teach and enforce this to the adults that are working with the student. And it's not just about, about helping the child, but helping the adults that are, you know, and, and this is a whole team approach. Uh, this workshop is going to be available on recording. And so this is something you could be sharing with your colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> that that is huge right and that's why i try providing the list of declarative language and a script for the emotion coaching because sometimes it is the adult who's interacting with the student so if i can empower them and give them some tools because that resistance doesn't usually mm -hmm. come by not wanting to do it it's with the lack of confidence to do it mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. educating them and giving them confidence to use certain strategies um usually empowers them makes them more willing to try these things Exactly. Uh, I think one of just yes, to and jump, go yeah, ahead. no, just to jump off on that point, you know, we touched on in the presentation this idea of co-regulation, right? So rather than trying to get compliance, is to understand that it's more likely a skill deficit than a will deficit, because a will deficit invites that power struggle, right? But if we see it as more of a skill deficit, child doesn't have the capacity to self-regulate well self-regulate their intention, their attention, self-regulate self their emotion. And part of our role is to help co-regulate so that, that that deficit is is accounted for, you know, and, and you spoke to it, Catherine, and Kim spoke to it quite a bit in terms of the different tools we can use to co-regulate. So structure and routine is, is a form of co-regulation. Visual schedule is a co-regulation. Exactly. So when we put those in place, the child's going to be feel safer and more contained, right? And that's just how we set up the environment. And then we can co-regulate at the next level by, you know, the rule, the routines of the classroom, how we speak to the students. And then we can co-regulate at a more intensive level in terms of what we do with the child in a one-on-one, -on -one, like the emotion coaching would be example of, of that kind of co-regulation at an individual level. Mm -hmm. So sometimes just framing it that, that our, our task is really more about co-regulation than it is about compliance or just giving it direction. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we've run out of time. It's already 5.02. So I'm sorry for the, the last questions that are there. I did want to say, though, that there are links on the handout. And so you will be able to get access to further resources through some of these slides. So thank you, everybody, for, for your time for today's presentation. Please know that it, it really is an introduction to the collaboration between these two centers with your request we may do a part two or and or maybe even more than that next year and so forth and so thank you everybody for your time have a good evening thank, thank you. you i'll stop the recording